Lord's Day 24. That's our subject tonight. Lord's Day 24 of the Heidelberg Catechism. But why cannot our good works be the whole or part of our righteousness before God? Because that the righteousness which can be approved of before the tribunal of God must be absolutely perfect and in all respects conformable to the divine law. And also that our best works in this life are all imperfect and defiled with sin. What? Do not our good works merit, which yet God will reward in this and in a future life? This reward is not of merit, but of grace. But doth not this doctrine make men careless and profane? By no means, for it is impossible that those who are implanted into Christ by a true faith should not bring forth fruits of thankfulness. Beloved, which of these two errors do you think damns more people to hell? <clears throat> Deception regarding one's evil works, so that someone thinks, well, I'm too wicked for me ever to be seen. Or deception regarding one's own good works. So that the person reckons, I can earn heaven and the favor of God in part by my virtuous deeds. I say again, which do you think damns more people to hell? Being deceived regarding one's evil works or being deceived regarding one's good works. Which do you think does more damage in the world at large, around the globe? Which do you think slays more in Northern Ireland? And I would guess, and you understand it can only be a guess, that for our own country at least, that if Deception regarding one's evil works slays its thousands. It's deception regarding one's good works that slays its tens of thousands. There are all sorts of people in this province who are going to hell because they think that they will be saved in part by their own good works. This issue of good works always arises when you teach the truth of justification. That one's declaration as to righteousness in the sight of God is by faith alone, through grace alone, in Jesus Christ alone, and to the glory of God alone. And this is taught in Scripture alone. And I say again, once that truth of justification is taught, the false view of good works always arises. And this is exactly what happens in our Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 23, which we looked at last time, asks, Well, what good does it do you, believing evangelical doctrine? Answer, 59. I'm righteous in Christ before God and an heir of eternal life. And then the next two question and answers explain what it is to be righteous before God. It's by faith alone. It's in Christ alone. And then come the objections. But why cannot our good works be the whole or part of our righteousness before God. Or question 63, what? Do not our good works merit which yet God will reward in this and in the future life? And again, but surely this doctrine of justification by faith alone makes men careless and profane. And this is how it has always been beloved. 
They teach the justification by faith alone at the Reformation in the 16th century when our catechism was written. These were the objections. When the Apostle Paul taught this in the 1st century AD, he got the same objections. When the church preaches the true gospel today, this notion rises up in people's minds. But, but what about good works? What about good works? And you, when you witness to someone outside of Jesus Christ, this is what they say to you. But I thought I was a good person. But that can't be right. Surely I've earned with God. Doesn't the Bible teach that good works mean that you get rewarded? Surely then my good works contribute and make me acceptable to God. So let's look this evening at Lord's Day 24 asking this question. Are man's good works his righteousness before God? When I say, are man's good works his righteousness before God, I mean either wholly his righteousness before God or part of his righteousness before God. Because ultimately, whether in whole or in part, it comes down to the same thing. Are man's good works his righteousness before God? Who believes this? Why are they wrong? And what arguments do they use? Are man's good works his righteousness before God? Who believes this? Why are they wrong? And what arguments do they use? In starting a list of who believes this, you have to begin with Roman Catholicism. According to the Church of Rome, in its preaching and teaching and creeds, all sorts of good works and good here in inverted commas, all sorts of good works obtain righteousness with God. When someone obeys God's commandments, and I have to add a parenthesis here, externally and partially, though not even partially, when someone obeys or seems to obey God's commandments, that's a good work. That obtains righteousness. When someone obeys the Roman Catholic Church's commandments, that's actually an even more righteous thing to do. Especially if the church's commandments go above and beyond what God requires in his word. Because then you're into the realm of super erogation. You're going further than what God requires and then you can pick up some credits, some merit. So you've got man's works, all that the sinner does, that he thinks is some good in it. Then you add to that the sort of second ingredient in the baking of this cake, the works of the saints, and particularly the work of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And when Rome says the Blessed Virgin Mary, do not for one moment think that it's the same as the woman you read about in the Bible. It's a goddess made up by the, man, by the fancy of man's mind. You throw in your own works, you whip them around, mix them up with the works of the saints, and then you throw in some of the works of Jesus Christ. And those three together constitute one's righteousness before God. And if you ask of the Roman Church, well, what about the divine punishment for sin? They'll tell you, well, we believe in the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ bore the eternal punishment of sin. Ah, but don't be deceived. It sounds good, but there's a but coming. The cross of Jesus bore the eternal punishment of sin. Listen for the word eternal. But as for the temporal punishment of sin, the sinner has to bear that in connection with his own works. That's where penance comes in. Holy deeds, such as saying so many, heal Mary's which is the ecclesiastical equivalent, I suppose, of a schoolboy who's committed some misdemeanor and who's asked to write lines. Then after penance, Rome would say purgatory. That also deals with the temporal punishment for sins in which the sinner is plunged into 
awful fire, the exact same fire as the fire that burns in hell, only he can get out of it. And he's in a slightly different place, purgatory, which of course doesn't exist. And then besides penance and purgatory, paying for the temporal punishment of sin, there are indulgences. Here the work is not the work of suffering or the work of performing supposedly holy deeds, but the work of paying money to reduce one's time in purgatory or indeed to reduce someone else's time in purgatory. In the Roman system, salvation is very clearly by the works of man and the work of Christ with man's works being decisive. Someone could say, ah, but you've spiced it up a bit. You've been very critical in your presentation of it. And undoubtedly I have. When you're dealing with error, it's very hard to be anything else other than critical. But a Roman Catholic spokesman would realize, yes, we do believe. They don't try and hide it. We do believe in justification by faith and works. Of course we do. We're completely right in believing that. And you, who believe in justification by faith alone, believe in sheer heresy. Church ripping heresy. Which has wrought massive division in the church now for half a millennium. Justification or salvation is by faith and works. And when I say faith... The Roman church realizes and is open about it. I mean faith wrought in part by man's free will, which is necessary for the whole endeavor, because since man does his works of his own free will in part, he can earn with God. I began with Rome because not only is it the largest professing Christian group, but it is especially the background to Lord's Day 24. Ursinus and Levianus and the church at Heidelberg, they had Rome very clearly in mind. They had come out of the church of Rome. They'd seen her errors. They were surrounded and threatened by attack from the church of Rome and her enemies and her armies. They were dealing with Rome, number one. Eastern Orthodoxy holds the same views, if not worse. You think Roman Catholicism is bad regarding salvation by works. It at least came into contact more clearly with the Reformation and so cleaned itself up a bit. So that it looks a bit more deceptive. Eastern Orthodoxy never even really had that contact. It's even more crass. And it also is a very large institution too. But it's not just Romanism and Eastern Orthodoxy, it's liberal Protestantism. Liberal Protestantism, make no mistake about it, teaches justification by faith and works. Man's good works are the crucial factor in his reconciliation with God and ultimate salvation. And these good works, liberal Protestantism, will affirm just as boldly as the heart of Church of Rome, are performed out of man's free will. This is a crucial component in the belief system of liberal Protestantism. They all, to a man, believe in man's free will. This is the thinking in liberal Protestantism of ministers and elders and members, it's an unquestioned, and for some of them, an unquestionable assumption. And they're all ultimately looking for their salvation to their own good works. And if they're honest with you, and if you ask the right question, they'll admit it. That's their hope. And this is so appalling because this is the exact opposite of the gospel. This is the exact opposite of Protestantism. 
This is the exact opposite of their creeds. The Westminster Standards of Presbyterianism, for instance, or the 39 Articles of the Anglican Churches around the world. And one key factor to see if a church is faithful in its Protestant beliefs or apostate and liberal, one key factor is, is it engaged in false ecumenism with the Church of Rome? And if it is engaged in false ecumenism with the Church of Rome, you know of a surety that as a denomination, it does not believe in justification by faith alone. Because justification by faith alone was the principal doctrine that put the wedge between the true church and the false church 500 years ago. I say again, where a church or denomination is in ecumenical talks with the Church of Rome, it does not, as a denomination, hold faithfully to justification by faith alone. It's already a false church. If it's engaged in ecumenical relations with the Eastern Orthodox Church, which denies justification by faith alone with great vehemence too, you know it has lost the article of a standing or following church. It repudiates and compromises justification by faith alone. Because for a church to engage in this sort of liaison with Romanism or Eastern Orthodoxy, it is only because they know that they share at some crucial level the same gospel. The same gospel of righteousness by, to whatever degree, and 1% or not point, not, not, not 1% is far too much, Righteousness by man's good works. Which also means righteousness by man's good works, which good works come out of man's free will. They all believe free will. That's who man is. Man can perform good works. That's part of his righteousness. That's why they're finding each other out. They're both lost. Lost for the truth. They've lost the gospel. And like several men lost in a wood who can't find their way out, the best they can do is holler and find each other. And then they can walk round and round in circles, at least with the comfort of holding someone else's hands. I may be lost, but I've got somebody with me. And we're quite a big group, because that's all that they can do. But it's not just liberal Protestantism. But it is also so-called evangelical Arminianism which denies the gospel of justification by faith alone. Let me show you the teachings of historical Arminianism. The historical Arminianism which was condemned by the Synod of Dort almost 400 years ago. The Canons of Dort in Head 2, Rejection of Errors 4, deal with the Arminians. They teach, this is their error, that God, having revoked the demand of perfect obedience of the law, that God regards faith itself and the obedience of faith although imperfect, as the perfect obedience of the law and does deem it worthy of the reward of eternal life through grace. And Article 1, Rejection of Errors 3 is very similar. That's worth repeating. The righteousness before God according to Arminius and historical Arminianism consists of faith itself and the obedience of faith. According to historic Arminianism, one's righteousness before God now and on the last day is not wholly the righteousness of Christ. It's not even partly the righteousness of Christ. It is man's own faith, which for an Arminian means free will, and man's own works. That's astounding. And it actually comes to this. That Romanism, false as it is. Has a 
larger place for Christ's righteousness, as it says that our righteousness is partly Christ's righteousness, but Romanism has a larger place for Christ's righteousness in our justification than does historic Arminianism. Historic Arminianism does not teach that our righteousness consists of partly Christ's righteousness and partly ours. Historic Arminianism teaches that our righteousness consists wholly of our free will. That's a good work. We're believing in Jesus and doing him a favour. And all the good works we do, which we think we do, out of our free will. And it's not just liberal Protestantism or evangelical Arminianism, at least historical Arminianism, but the federal vision in Protestant churches. Well, they claim to be Presbyterian and Reformed. They're not liberal. They're not Arminian. They say, no, no, we're, we're Orthodox. We're creedal. We're Protestants. They hold a conditional covenant. That is, the covenant depends on us. And what is salvation if it's not covenant salvation? Covenant salvation is conditional. That is, it depends on us. And what is righteousness if righteousness is not given in the covenant of grace? This is the point of Galatians chapter 3. So covenant righteousness, like the covenant, is conditional. It depends on us. It depends on our faith and on our good works. One of the leading spokesmen for this movement stated that our obedience is the righteousness of faith. Oh no. The righteousness of faith is the righteousness which faith receives at the hand of God. The righteousness which Jesus Christ provides in his holy life and sufferings. Our obedience is the righteousness of faith. That is, we believe, we obey, and the righteousness which stands before God is in part our obedience. And their error can be approached and exploded in various ways, but it's especially evident when they present their teachings about final justification, that is, one's justification on the last day at the great judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And then, when the question goes forth, what is your righteousness? The answer is, my righteousness is what Jesus Christ did for me and the good works which I have done. And then it gets worse because our final righteousness, the righteousness with which a person stands before God on the last day, cannot be really anything different from the righteousness with which we stand before God right now. And so it gets imported back into our standing before God in the present. As a Christian, you might come rather naively to Lord's Day 24 and say, but you need to be crazy to believe that someone's good works could be part of their righteousness before God. And you say, yeah, you would, you would. But a lot of people... Doctrinally, theologically, are crazy. Who hath bewitched you? That's the question in Galatians 3 verse 1. I taught you the truth of justification by faith alone. Who has bewitched you? What happened to you? And of course, this teaching that one's own works contribute either in part or in whole, of one's own righteousness, is the teaching of the cults. And they're very explicit about it too. The JWs, the Mormons, righteousness by good works. And within the cults, it's especially the righteousness of good works in proselytizing. If you just witness hard enough, you could make yourself one of the 144,000. There is justification by works with a vengeance into a sort of elitism. And Judaism, as a religion, is a religion of justification by works. This is what Jesus taught in his parable in Luke 18. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. That is, 
God never listened to a word he said. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I'm not committing bad works, unjust, adultery. I'm doing good works. I give tithes. I fast twice in the week. And, because he was a very pious man, he thanked God for his good works and attributed to God a certain amount of grace to enable him to be as good as he was so that he, by grace, could merit. And Jesus delivered this parable, he tells us in verse 9, he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. They trusted in themselves. That is, they believed, not in Christ, they believed in themselves. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Their righteousness, this was their belief, was in themselves. And what they had done, and in the fact that they didn't do other things. And being pious, they then said, we're doing it all by God's grace. We thank thee, Lord, that we're not like other people. And in the next generation, the Apostle Paul identified this as the error of Christ rejecting Judaism according to Romans chapter 9 verses 31 and following Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness wherefore because they sought it not by faith but as it were by works chapter 10 verse 3 they that is the Israelites being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. What are they doing? What are they doing every day? They're going about to establish their own righteousness. Everything they do, they're writing it in the ledger. I'm making myself good, O Lord. Here are my works. Accept me as righteous. And the Apostle Paul had to deal with these Judaizers, those who imbibed the view of many of the Jews of salvation and justification by works he had to combat these Judaizers who were infecting the churches of Galatia and that's what the epistle to the Galatians is all about including the part we read the first half of Galatians 3 and things haven't changed in the present day Judaism and the various aspects or groups within Judaism, they all believe in justification by works. They do. And if you think of Islam, what are the five pillars of Islam? They are the five pillars holding up what? Justification by works. You've got to declare that Allah is the only true God and Muhammad is his prophet. Good work number one. That's where it starts. You pray five times a day. Good work number two. Charitable giving. Good work number three. Fasting. Good work number four. Pilgrimage to Mecca. Because their beliefs are that that pilgrimage is, to use a Christian term, meritorious. And just as the Reformation with its gospel of justification by faith alone had Martin Luther and all his proponents saying, these pilgrimages are idolatrous. It's all about merit. Well, going to Mecca is even more openly and explicitly about earning with Allah. Those are the five separate pillars. And there are many other laws. That's why Islam is a religion of law. Sharia. Law, 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 law. I mean, it's got more laws than the European Union. It's a religion of law and therefore of works you earn with Allah and the idea is that if you can earn enough achieve enough by your good works then you can outweigh your sins why why is righteousness by man's good works in whole or in part why is it the majority view why is it in the false and pagan religions? Why is it in much of Christianity, broadly conceived? Why is it in 
much, if not most, of <coughs> Protestantism, despite the Reformation, why has the truth been lost by so many? The answer is that salvation by works is the way of man's sinful flesh. If you ask man as fallen and carnal, how do you think you're going to get back into a right relationship with God? They will all tell you, well, it must be by doing good. It must be by being good and making yourself better and self-help. Why do they say that? Because man is wicked. Because man's selfish. Because man's blind. He never acknowledges, unless sovereign grace teaches him otherwise, that he's totally depraved and that all of his works are wholly polluted by sin. That to him is as crazy a notion as he ever could dream of unless the Spirit teaches him that. Unless, to return to John chapter 16, unless the Spirit shows him that his sin is that he doesn't believe in Jesus and that righteousness is that Jesus has gone to be with the Father and that there's righteousness in what he did. And that judgment is that Christ has come and already defeated Satan and the whole world. Unless I say the Spirit of Christ comes and convicts him of sin, righteousness and judgment. He'll never acknowledge that he's totally depraved and that all his works are wholly polluted by sin. And that's why the gospel comes as a revelation from heaven. The only way in which Simon Peter was able to say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, is as Jesus told us, flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And the only way in which someone can believe the gospel of free righteousness in Jesus alone is if, not by flesh and blood revealing, but if my Father reveals it to you from heaven. From heaven comes this word, Jesus Christ alone obtains righteousness by his own deeds. Faith alone can receive it because faith is into renunciation. Faith <laughs> renounces all your good works. I haven't got any good works, Lord. I haven't got a single thing that was ever good. And faith looks solely to Jesus Christ. The revelation from heaven is that grace alone gives us righteousness. You don't earn it by your efforts. And that the God of heaven alone is glorified in this way and not by our trying to make ourselves good before him of ourselves. Scripture alone declares this heavenly and flesh-denying gospel. We need to move on. Why are they wrong? We've said so much, but why are they wrong? And here I want to make three simple points. You understand now, it's not made to say, well, look, they're wrong. But when you clear away the errors, you say, yes, this is the truth. This is what I need. This is what we as a church need. This is what needs to get out. The first reason why they are wrong, a very simple, basic reason is, they don't understand who God is or what God requires. God is 100% righteous. Searingly righteous. With an altogether divine righteousness. The one who is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity and cannot look on sin, as Habakkuk puts it. And God therefore requires that we be as righteous as as he is. Ooh. Not, oh, you're doing your best, or that's pretty good, but 100% perfection, as righteous as I am. In every work that you do, every day, every moment, in thought, word, and deed. Because this is scripture. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That one verse takes all the false religion of justification of man's work 
and scraps the whole thing. Even if you were to keep it all, one little error, and you're guilty of the whole lot. Here's Galatians 3 verse 10. God says, Moses penned these words and Paul quotes them. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Do you realize what you're trying to do when you try and earn with God? You are saying to God, in effect, go on, curse me, curse me. That's their religion. You say, it can hardly be as bad as that. Well, we await the last day when God will be true to his word. And that's why anybody with an ounce of true religion about them Praise with holy David. Enter not into judgment with thy servant. For in thy sight shall no man living be justified. And that's what all the false church do. We can't have a prayer like that. That's David, the man after God's own heart. He understood. He understood who God is and what God requires. But the error is not only the false religionists don't understand who God is and what he requires, but they don't even understand who man is and what his works are. What is man? Original sin. The great Christian doctrine of original sin. We're all guilty in our covenant head, Adam. And being guilty for his first transgression... Adam being our great representative, God has punished the human race with total depravity. And total depravity is total. Which means man is without free will. He cannot choose God or the good. Without free will and being totally depraved, he has no ability to do good works or even to prepare or dispose himself for salvation. And therefore, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good. There are no good works of man. None righteous, no, not one. None that doeth good. That is, there is nobody who does good works. Man's works are described in Isaiah 64, verse 6. All our righteousness is... All of them are as filthy rags. I've mentioned before that the idea here is menstruous rags. Filthy, stinking, disgusting. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do the children see it? Question 62. But why cannot our good works be the whole or part of our righteousness before God? Because that the righteousness which can be approved of before the tribunal of God must be absolutely perfect and in all respects conformable to the divine law. That's about God and what he requires of us. And then about man and his works and also that our best works in this life are all imperfect and defiled with sin. We can go further. Not only is this whole notion a total corruption of who God is and what he requires, who man is and what his works are, but this notion that we can be saved even in part by our good works fails to understand who Jesus Christ is and what he has achieved. Jesus is the eternal God, fully equal with the Father and the Spirit. He became incarnate for us and our salvation, and he's perfectly righteous, always obedient to God's law, and he totally satisfied for all of our sins by bearing the punishment for his people 
on the cross. And so the Apostle Paul says, listen to these scriptures. Galatians 3.13 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Romans 3.24 We are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God has made Christ to be sin for us, he who knew no sin, so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There you have it. This means that those who try to add anything to God's righteousness in Jesus Christ, thereby reject God's righteousness in Jesus Christ. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say you and a team of other men are building the high, strong outer wall of a citadel. And your son comes along. It's all very cute. And he says, Daddy, at my birthday you gave me some Lego. And now, Daddy, I think I can help you build this wall. You know the way children are, and it's rather sweet. Look, take my Lego and put it in there, and that'll make it better, Daddy. And you say, I appreciate the effort. Now, I, I really like the fact you're interested in my work, and maybe you're going to be a builder when you grow up. But, son, it doesn't work like that. And I'll explain to you later, but I've got to get on with my job. You've really got to to do it with these bricks. And he still doesn't understand. You say, I'll talk to you later. Let's just go home. But now, to take a biblical imagery, Jesus Christ provides a spotless robe of righteousness for his people. Righteousness, imputed righteousness, like putting on the coat or robe. The Bible used that figure in Zechariah 3 and and in Isaiah. And now, to quote Isaiah again, you've got this spotless, wonderful robe, and then you say, you know what we need to fill out that robe? Here's a rag. Here's a menstruous rag. That'll make it better. And then you can stand before God. And that isn't supplementing it. That isn't completing it. That isn't perfecting it. That's to despise Jesus Christ and to attack his perfect righteousness. Galatians 2.21 I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness came by the law then Christ is died in vain. You're making the cross nothing when you try to add the slightest work to it. But lastly, what arguments do they offer? (coughs) Question 63. What? I don't believe what you're saying. This can't be right. Do not our good works merit, which yet God will reward in this and in a future life? Well, there is no such thing as a fallen human being merited. Because we're told to be perfect, and you can never go beyond perfection. And in fact, being sinful, we always fall short. Even believers who have the work of the Spirit in them and who can perform books which, works which are to some extent good. Luke 17 verse 10, our Savior taught us, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, even if it were possible, say, we are unprofitable servants. We only did that which was our duty to do. And so we could never fill up for any of our sins in the past. And even the good works of a believer, because believers do do good works. They're not part of our righteousness before God. Christ's righteousness is 100% of our justifying righteousness with which we stand before God in the last day. The good works of a believer, such as they are, are imperfect. And they are rewarded, though. What God does is that he forgives the sins in them, in his grace and for sake of Christ's merits, and he sees the good in the believer's good works, the one who's already justified, and he rewards them, but he doesn't reward them with salvation, 
we are already saved. We're already justified. He gives us rewards in heaven. The Bible teaches this truth, which is summed in the great phrase of Augustine, the reward of grace. God forgives our sins. He enables us to do good works. And then, but like what we saw this morning, seeing his work in us, that he wrought in us by the Holy Spirit, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to reward you for what I did in you by my grace. But there's no justifying righteousness in the works of the believer. Argument number two. Question 64. But doth not this doctrine make men careless and profane? I appeal to your conscience. Does this truth of justification by faith alone, in connection with all the truths of the word of God and some in our confessions, does this make you careless? So you couldn't give a hoot for the Christian life. And does this make you profane and worldly? On the contrary, it's forgetting the truth of justification by faith alone that you become careless and that you become profane. And look at all the false churches who deny justification by faith alone. I appeal to your conscience here too. Do you think their members are living even outwardly decent lives or are they not careless and profane you live in this country you rub shoulders of people you meet Roman Catholics you meet liberal Protestants you meet members of the cults careless and profane they sure are those people who are justified by faith alone have a true faith true faith lives and purifies us and our lives most surely it does those who are justified by faith alone are also necessarily sanctified that second distinct blessing always accompanies the justified you're dead to the rule of sin you're alive unto God live that way and you do those who are justified by faith alone are necessarily united to Jesus Christ union with Christ you are justified in Christ in fellowship with him you receive him union with Christ how could anybody who is really united with Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit live a careless and profane life anybody who lives a careless and profane life is not united by the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ and therefore not justified at all doth not this doctrine make men careless and profane the reformed faith answers by no means what a foolish crazy notion for it is impossible that those who are implanted into Christ by a true faith should not bring forth fruits of thankfulness two very obvious and important applications flow from all this with these we close if you are outside of Jesus Christ tonight your calling before God is repudiate all of your supposed good works for the simple reason that you don't have any and that what you think is a good work is actually a filthy and menstruous rag throw it away as you would do with such a rag you can never earn with God instead acknowledge your sin and repent before God and look for righteousness where it alone may be found in Jesus Christ all your righteousness is in him and second if you are a child of God justified by faith alone because of Jesus and his perfect righteousness then your duty isn't add to it your duty is to give thanks for it what have you except that which you have received it's a salvation, holy, gracious. Be grateful. And bring forth fruits of thankfulness to the God of all grace. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy word and the wonderful gospel of free righteousness in Jesus Christ alone. We acknowledge it came from heaven and that no man could ever have dreamt this up. Give us a faith that clings to this all our days and bring others to the knowledge of the gospel of grace. 
For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.